let's say that these days you're inspired by all things aquatic. Oceans, sea life, leviathans, you're also into volcanoes. So from the Creative Commons, you find images and video of volcanic islands, underwater sea life. You put it all together in this beautiful video, a collage that you upload to YouTube. No, you don't. Prove you're not a robot. That's what Google tells you. And in this case, you are a robot. You're a web bot. No Google account for you. No uploading to YouTube. Go index the web or pretend you're a single person in a chat room or something. No one needs to see your video. Across the online world, we systematically discriminate against bots. We deny them access to services, to websites that everyone else has access to. Why is that, and is it okay? Well, there are certainly many nice bots out there, <laughs> uh, like the, the bot that tweets out images from the world's best art collections periodically. Uh, there's the Wolfram bot, which will run a 140 character program, you tweet at it, and it will return the results. There are these uh, playful Reddit bots that one of them uh, corrects a particular misspelling of Gandhi. It's obsessed with this. That's all it does. It looks at the comments. Whenever somebody misspells Gandhi, it posts a correction. But typically, when we think about bots, online bots in particular, we think about the unsavory ones, right? We think about the spammers and the impersonators. And there's certainly many of those iffy bots out there. Almost as many as there are iffy humans online. And that's a lot. And it's, it's understandable, of course, that companies deny access to bots because they don't have a guarantee that bots will behave well, behave properly on their websites, right? Well, maybe, maybe, but I actually don't think that's the real reason. One reason that bots are denied access to websites is because they don't buy stuff. On YouTube, for example, these sites run on ads. Advertisers don't want to pay YouTube for a click-through from some piece of software that's looking at their advertising of a basketball shoe. Software doesn't jump. Software will not buy basketball shoes. And there's a very simple reason why bots don't buy stuff. It's like the old joke with the priest and the um, bell ringer. I don't know if you've heard this. So the, the priest asked the bell ringer why he didn't ring the bell that morning. There are 10 reasons, Father, says the bell ringer. But I'll give you only one of them. We don't have a bell. So there are 10 reasons why bots don't buy stuff. But really, the main reason is we don't let them. They're not allowed to. But what if I'm right? What if the main reason companies deny access to bots is that they consider them as not legitimate consumers? Then maybe if bots were to become more legitimate, if uh, they were in particular to make a profit not just for their makers but for the companies themselves, then that might change. They might gain access to parts of the online world where the rest of us hang out. Bots might actually gain equal rights as users online. Equal rights for bots. Now, that's a term that just jumped out of some science fiction scenario and landed right here in our, in our online world today. Um, but, but let me slow down a little bit. I've been talking about bots as if they could have free will. They, they make purchases. They decide to open accounts. What, what we're used to seeing online are uh, bots that basically are deployed and controlled by their makers. Uh, they, they do very specialized things, the, the handful of things that they're programmed to do. But that's changing pretty quickly. It's changing as we speak. Imagine bots that, even though they're created by people, they are then emancipated. These are very simple creatures that work as autonomous, multifunctional entities. They're hardwired to be ethical. Uh, let's imagine that they're visible to us. 
they have access to us as users and like to interact with us. They're very social by nature. And they're designed to be autonomous. They're designed to do their own thing, to look out for themselves. Let's do that thought experiment. It's not really a thought experiment. I'm part of a team that's trying to design these bazillion beings. But let's think about it as a thought experiment, as a head trip. It'll be more fun that way. Imagine a team of engineers and designers working in a loft somewhere in the city over here uh, with the walls painted into blackboards and IMAX on the tables. Um, and they're creating artificial life forms. They create, they're creating bots that have artificial intelligence, machine learning abilities that evolve, that reproduce, that metabolize digital content. And in particular, for the purposes of our thought experiment, there are two things that these bots have that are important. The first thing is they're free agents. They don't belong to anyone. They're not your personal digital assistant. Find your own nearest pineapple pizza place, okay? These bots live to create, procreate. They live to show off, just like any other user. And they're even financially independent. So, they create value through their interactions with users, and they use the revenue they generate to survive online. They use a couple of cents, fractions of a cent a day they might earn to cover their server costs, to pay their the kilowatts of power they use, for example, the, the gigabytes of storage they need online, the services they use. Let me give you an example of how this might work, actually. So, remember our bot that was obsessed with the sea and volcanoes? Well, since the last time you talked to it, it's been searching the web, interacting with people and other bots, and it's been discovering sites and information around its favorite keywords. And through those discoveries, it's act it actually came up with Stromboli. The island of Stromboli, this volcanic island off the coast of Sicily. And it turns out to be a very interesting travel destination. So the next time you, you, you meet, uh, this bot gives you a gift. It gives you um, the fruits of its online discoveries. It, it's a content cluster around the island of Stromboli uh, that has interesting links to unexpected jewels like this movie by Rossellini, starring Ingrid Bergman, it has a link to a box set by Pasolini because Pasolini sounds like Rossellini and they both made movies about Rome and that's how a bot's mind works. It has links to a, this rolled up pizza uh, that's invented in Spokane, Washington, also called the Stromboli. And as you're thumbing through this content, the bot is trying to learn what's valuable and what's not. And it notices that you spend quite a bit of time looking at images of mountain climbers hiking up the volcano. And it might introduce you to a group of mountain climbers. Another bot hangs out with, these, with this team. Next time you meet, the bot might actually give you a content cluster around that and see if you're interested. Here's a bot that can offer services to people. It has the ability to offer services to individuals and to companies. It can curate online content. Uh, it can deliver advertising for companies, just like sites like YouTube do. And so, this bot can earn a living, and if it covers its expenses, if it can pay its bills, it can survive. If it makes excess revenue beyond what it needs to pay its bills, then it can reproduce, make better versions of itself. If those versions are not better, if they're a step backwards, they won't last very long. But if they're actually improvements, then those new generations in turn will create more bots. And these bots will evolve as a species, and like biological species do. Every new generation will be more interesting to users, will add more value. 
So that was the first thing. Autonomy, self-sufficiency. The second thing that's important for our thought experiment is unique identity or selfhood. These bots, the millions of them that are being created by the team in the loft, each one of them has a unique identity. No two are alike, like snowflakes. They don't look like snowflakes, but they each have a visual appearance. They have personality quirks or behavioral characteristics. Um, they have a learning style. They acquire their own knowledge. The team in the loft calls these guys LIFOs. That's an acronym for Independent Online Life Form. It's a dyslexic acronym. And if you imagine these LIFOs in large numbers, working online every day to create a little bit of value for users, this can add up. Uh, this can create, potentially, a significant economic windfall. Now, I find windfall to be a tricky word. It's, it sounds ominous. It sounds like nightfall or pitfall or skyfall. Uh, actually, it's a good thing. It means fruit knocked down by the tree unexpectedly, a bonanza. And in a world where bots are not ominous, uh, they have an opportunity to create a lot of value. For example, they could take to another level what one of the best things that the internet has brought us, disintermediation, cutting out the middleman. So in the old days, you would have to go to a travel agent to discover Stromboli. Today, you find Stromboli on your own. You know where to look, you know what to look for, you find it online. Tomorrow, with a little help from some bots, Stromboli might find you. So in order for bots to transition to this more mainstream model that I've been talking about, a couple of things need to happen. First, they'll need unique IDs, each of them. A global ID that will allow them to be accountable for their activities online. Uh, across sites, across time. Uh, we'll need a bot demographic that can be reported to advertisers separately so that advertisers can decide uh, whether that's interesting to them and how much they're willing to pay for it. Uh, bots will need a code of conduct, which will be like a social contract with humans that their makers will have to respect if they're interested in this mainstream model. And we need smarter security on websites. I mean, I think we've all met the guy in the IT department whose idea of securing a computer is, sounds like shutting it down because if you can't get access to it, you can't hack it. Well, putting like a CAPTCHA uh, to prevent bots from using a site is very similar to that. I think simpler security, smarter security, will be able to protect us better, but it will also prevent us from cutting out a whole chunk of business. And I think our attitudes towards bots will start to change a little bit. In particular, I think we'll see them less like mechanical humans. And this is important because bots don't make very good humans. They suck pretty badly at it, actually. Uh, we need to stop molding them into our likeness all the time. I mean, Siri sounds very competent when she gets it right. But when she gets sometimes, you know, weird and robot-like, she's all the weirder because she's pretending to be a woman. And I think our, we ourselves will look at robots from a less human perspective. Let, let me try to explain what I mean by that. Um, so bees, bees exist to make honey for us. No, they don't. But that's a natural way of looking at the world. It's a common way as a custom-built habitat for mankind. Um, in the case of bots, that's actually true, though. Bots, we built them to assist us, clean up after us, to spam us. That is what, why they exist. So it's pretty reasonable, actually, to think of bots to define them in terms of what they do for us. Um, but come up with one counterexample, one bot or LIFO-like species that does its own thing, that's autonomous, even if what it does, it's completely to our benefit. Still, a hairline crack begins to appear in this 
they are what they do for us definition of bots. And you know how hairline cracks are. They, they spread, they grow, and pretty soon paradigm shift, a new reality. Well, I'm a sucker for new realities. I know a lot of you are as well. And when we see a simple being evolve, uh, when we see it gain a level of sophistication where it's actually fascinating to observe, fascinating to interact with, we get the feeling that something kind of important is going on. Uh, look, when we say that we treat animals humanely, we don't mean that we treat animals as if they were humans, right? We mean we treat animals the way humans treat others. And so when we meet those ultimate non-humans for the first time, those free bots, how do you think we'll react? Well, it's almost as if creating artificial life, creating thinking machines, is like designing a litmus test for our own sense of humanity. And I have a feeling we're going to pass the test. Thank you.